creative living. Utilizing today's technology with the best of the past to bring you innovative ideas and up-to-date information for creative lifestyles in today's active world. With your host, Cheryl Borden. I'm so glad you joined me today for Creative Living. We're going to learn how animals can help patients with PTSD. We'll learn how to preserve fresh herbs and also talk about water retaining plants. One of my guests today is Matthew Festa and he's with an organization called Guardians of Rescue. Matthew's going to explain how animals who have been trained through a program called Animals Helping People can help anyone with post-traumatic stress disorder, especially military personnel. He lives in Smithtown, New York. Another guest is Carol Finster, and she's a cookbook author and dietitian from Centennial, Colorado. Carol will discuss how to grow and harvest your own herbs, show how to store them, and also explain some ways to preserve fresh herbs. Her company is Savory Palette Incorporated. And we'll begin the show with Kurt James, who will show some new products on the market for water-retaining plants, including a palmer that's also good for gardens, lawns, trees, and shrubs. Kurt's business is Garden Source Nursery and Landscaping, and he lives in Portales, New Mexico. Kurt, thank you so much for being here today. I recently heard you do a program on gardening and landscaping and preparing the yard and the flower beds, and I thought, oh my goodness, it is that time of the year. So I, I wanted you to tell us some of the things that we need to be doing right now. Okay, Cheryl, thanks for having me. Uh, since springtime is the time that people want to uh, plant their containers, it's nice to be able to save water, because sometimes if you uh, water your container in the morning, by the time you get home in the afternoon, it's droopy and, mm -hmm. and needs a drink of water. But what I brought in today are some ways that they can keep those containers fresh uh, even while they're on vacation. And it conserves water because we're not wasting it. Absolutely, and that's mm -hmm. important these days. Well, container gardening, <clears throat> I remember you showed me how to make one one time in another class of yours that I went to. And what's so special about container gardens? Container gardens are important, or not important, but they're, they're uh, uh, Fun. Fun, because uh, you can move them around the yard <laughs> and on the patio, like. and, and if you don't like it in this spot, you can move it to another to accent a different part of your yard. Uh -huh. And that's what's nice about containers. And then you can rotate them, you can turn them. But uh, what I have here today are some ways that we can uh, make the pot look better and continually water it, no matter where oh. you put it. Okay. okay, I like that. I need that help. <laughs> well, good. Uh, once your container, or before your container is planted, actually, I brought in a uh, water retaining polymer. That sounds like a big name, but basically what it is, and I brought in an example today, is a uh, little crystal that once you add water to, it expands to up to 50 times its size. Uh -huh. it's, yeah, it's just real fine. looks like salt, actually, it is, doesn't uh, it? It is, very fine and small. So once water is added to it, or when you water your container, it expands, so that way when the soil dries out, it releases the water back out and into the pot. And is that what this is? That looks is like exactly rocks. it. So it, this is before big. and after. Wow. And uh, if, if you are planting trees or putting down new sod in your lawn, this one right here is a finer powder, but you can see that it uh, also holds water. Well, and that's expands, important uh -huh. these days to conserve as much water as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, w whenever you are planting your container, uh, the product that you purchase will tell you on the back how much to use per container. So uh, a container this size will need about probably a tablespoon. That and you that's just all? That's uh -huh. exactly right. You just simply uh, Work uh, it, into it into the, the soil, soil. Oh, okay. and then uh, go ahead and plant your plants and then you're all set because it'll just take care of itself. These products also come with a uh, slow release fertilizer in them as well. So if you want something that's going to continually fertilize and continually help you with your water conservation, then that's your product. Well, and one thing, and I, I was bad about doing this, and I still don't do it all the time, but you always said to change out your soil each year. Absolutely. It's important to start with fresh soil uh -huh. every year. That way you start where there's no bugs in the soil and your, all the nutrients uh -huh. there can be replenished by putting in fresh soil. And then working that, so, that water retainer in would do a lot more good. Absolutely. And okay. a container this size will last you a couple of years years. Oh yeah, it would. Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, well, you have your water retaining polymer in there and you take off and water it and now you're, you're all set for a couple of days. But let's say you're going to go on vacation or you just don't want to go out there and water it every day. Oh. I brought in some products that are fairly new on the market. They're made of terracotta. Uh -huh. But the nice thing about them is it'll help enhance your container. Say you take your uh, favorite bottle of wine. I happen to bring in a clear one today. But if you have one that's blue or brown or it doesn't even have to be a wine bottle. It can be any type of bottle mm -hmm. that will fit down into this. Those um, look like ice cream cones. <laughs> they do, don't they? But see, they're uh, hollow inside. Uh -huh. And then you'll fill up your bottle with uh, water, and then you put it down into this, and then it sets down inside the container. Oh, 
just stick, you just it, stick it down in there. Enough that it'll hold it. Yes, and then what happens is the water will seep out and take up as much water uh -huh. as it needs. So if however because much of water the terracotta, there, that's absolutely. that's the secret right there. Yes, and, and you said you could also do a little water bottle on it or whatever. Yes, you sure can. Uh -huh. uh, just take a simple uh, water bottle and this one here that I brought in as an example, and you would fill it with water, and it has a. Uh, screw cap on oh, top. Oh, so so that's take, what makes it work you, on that. Absolutely. You take the top of the bottle off and then it uh, simply screws in there. Mm. Obviously you put water in it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then you set it back down in there and then it goes back in, it goes in the container as well. And then whenever you need to refill it, you just simply unscrew it or pull this out, fill it with mm. water and put it back in. And I see what you mean about if we had colored bottles or something, that would really be very pretty. It would make a conversation uh -huh. piece for your <laughs> container as well. It certainly would. Yes. Any other tips that you have for us for uh, saving water and, and resources? Um, anytime you are going to water, say, either a lawn or your container, you should deep water it less often. That way it brings the roots down further and it'll help. Uh, deep water it less often. That's exactly okay. right. And that right there will help conserve water. That's mm -hmm. with trees and shrubs, containers, and that you're watering. And I know you explained it at this meeting that I heard about xeriscaping. Some people think that's just rocks. They think it's zero scaping, it's but zero it's not. scaping, that's right. <laughs> there are a lot of colorful plants that you can use. You can use uh, succulents, there's uh, Russian sage, there's a lot of different things that will keep the, your water bill in check and also give you a beautiful yard. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I always learn so much when you come. Thank well, you. Yes, thank you. Carol, thank you so much for being with us again. I always love when you come because I tend to learn so much when you're here. We usually talk about maybe gluten-free cooking or mm -hmm. celiac disease because you are a known expert in the field of, of gluten-free recipes. In fact, your book, uh, which you don't have to have uh, celiac or anything else. I love no. the recipes in there. But you said we're going to talk about herbs. Now, what yeah. made you think of that? Well, herbs to me are this wonderful gift of nature to us that make our lives so much more wonderful. First of all, they're just beautiful uh -huh. to look at. I've even seen them used in floral arrangements because they're just pretty. Uh -huh. But they're also used medicinally. For example, this mint plant, you might pinch off and brew a cup of peppermint tea, which would help uh -huh. digestion. Um, sage is sometimes used for sore throats. We have thyme, we have have rosemary, we have basil, and we have parsley. And while we use them for beauty and for you know medicinal purposes, I think the thing that we enjoy the herbs the most for is cooking. eating and mm -hmm. cooking. You know, you they bet. bring such wonderful flavor, and um, and the aroma of of thing, something cooking mm -hmm. with an herb in it. I is, can smell the mint already. I, I know, <laughs> I know, it's just so so wonderful. But how many times has this happened to you? You get a recipe you want to try, mm -hmm. and you go to the store and you buy the herbs. And what is this? Two or three dollars? This at is least. A, a three is the least, unless they're on sale. Uh -huh. I've seen them as high as four. This is rosemary. Mm -hmm. Let's say the recipe calls for wait, maybe just one of these. One sprig. You know, one sprig. It depends uh -huh. on what you're doing. You put the rest back in the fridge, and then guess what? You forget about it. Uh huh. And it languishes back there, and then you don't know you don't know it's there, and then you find mm -hmm. it, and it's and you throw it away. You throw so it away. Two bucks. So it's two bucks a pop, and if you do that every month, I mean it's twenty four dollars a year if, it, if you buy other herbs. So what I want to talk about today is how you can protect your investment, whether you buy the herbs or if you're lucky to have pots growing outside mm -hmm. your kitchen like I do in the summer. I just love going out and cutting fresh herbs and then bringing mm -hmm. them in and cooking with them and it's just, it's such a joy. But I want to talk about storing. So whether, mm -hmm. this is big flat leaf parsley. It's, and that's it's, about a half of a bunch, This is a it? half. It's, yeah. it's way too much even for me to use and I cook every day. But mm -hmm. I wanted to show you that one way to protect your investment, whether you've bought these in the store as a bunch or were lucky enough to have a pot of parsley in your patio is to cut off the stems a little so they're they're like going to just like flowers uh -huh. yeah. yeah stick them in a glass of water and put them in the refrigerator and I've kept them for several days that way. If you want, you can take a big plastic bag and drape it over the top to protect and hold in moisture too. But um, That'll extend it a day or two. Us or so. Uh -huh. But the way I've been doing it lately a lot is to wrap the bunch, and this is the other half of this bunch, so oh. you can <laughs> see way more parsley than most people are going to eat, is to wrap it in a damp, first of all, you want to, I wash it wash first it. so that mm -hmm. I can just reach in the refrigerator and pull out a few um, sprigs and go on my uh -huh. way to cooking as opposed to stopping and washing Clean it. it. Mm -hmm. And you don't want this towel too wet, but then I put it just in a zip top paper or plastic bag. Mm -hmm. 
put it in my crisper, someplace where it won't crush. Uh -huh. And then I close it, but not all the way, oh. just so there's a little bit of air circulation. Oh. And I've kept parsley for over a week this way, and it's just, just as mm -hmm. fresh as can be. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I do is I make sure to pull off any, if I see them, any yellowing or brown decaying or, brown, uh -huh. because that's going to affect all the rest that's of good idea. what's uh -huh. in there. Now, that's how to store it, but let's say that you've got more than you can handle mm -hmm. or you realize you've got this rosemary languishing in the refrigerator <laughs> and you want to use it up. So here's the one method I use. This is just a plain old paper bag, mm -hmm. and this is one of my cruder methods, but it works. Is I just take and drop, this is um, fresh sage, oh. and I just drop it in the bag and then clip it shut and maybe put it in my garage, somewhere where nobody's going to bump it or uh -huh. you know no, nothing's going to get into it. This keeps it clean. But another way is if you want your sprigs to dry nice and straight, and maybe you do, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Then I cut a little hole in this and tuck the clothespin up. That's a great idea. And then what's happening is that, and you can set it somewhere, uh -huh. and I, what I've done is I've folded, folded the it. bottoms uh -huh. up so it's stable. And Keeps my herbs, bugs are, there's and no bugs, no dirt. You know, I learned this a, a while back, and it just amazed me. They said that herbs are one of the dirtiest things that you buy, because in, the dried kind, uh -huh. because they collect dust. That's uh -huh. what things do That's when they're growing do. in nature. Uh -huh. and it's really hard to get the dust off of them. So that's, that's one. one way of drying. My favorite way of drying, though, is this, is to take the fresh herbs, and I've shown you a bunch of them here, how I've done it, and lay them on a paper towel, which I'm not showing here, but you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Take the plate, lay a paper towel, wash your herbs, and pat them pretty well dry. dry. And then lay them, and I would only do one herb at a time. One I've, I've, type. Uh -huh. Right, one uh -huh. type. I've got a bunch here so we can be really efficient with space. But this is fresh oregano. This is dried oregano. This is fresh sage. Mm -hmm. This is dried sage. This is fresh rosemary, dried rosemary. Uh -huh. Over here is um, oregano fresh and dried. Oh, and the way uh -huh. I do that is I put them on the um, plate on the paper towel and put it in the microwave oven for just about one minute and then see how it looks. Then take, and take it out, uh -huh. look at it, pop it back, for another, and you do this in one minute increments. Yeah, and you watch it closely because you're probably going to only take two or three minutes uh -huh. and your herbs are dry. It's that quick. Uh -huh. And if you notice, I think the colors stay a little dar um, fresher looking, like you uh -huh. can barely tell. And there's yet, not much difference in there's some. There's not much difference, uh -huh. no, but uh -huh. yet these are crumbly, if you still crumble, sure. like that. Which is like you'd want to put it in your exactly. stew or whatever you were putting it and in. And so then what I do is, I, and this, you want to do this in a place where you have lots of um, room to make a mess. <laughs> okay. It's not all that messy. Let's just take uh, the rosemary, rosemary as an uh -huh. example. And you can do it this way, and then move it. your fingers uh -huh. down the stem, and there you are. It still smells good. It's I mean, you have the, all the fragrance. The drying of it. will not uh, disrupt the flavor at all. Mm -hmm. it, it actually, I think, mm -hmm. in a way, intensifies it. Mm -hmm. Although there's nothing that can beat fresh herbs. <laughs> and then I, uh, I put them in there, and then I use a funnel to get them into uh -huh. um, here. It's kind of hard to transfer. Or some wax paper. Type. Yeah, wax mm -hmm. paper funnel or mm -hmm. a little tiny funnel. And so stay, save your old spice jars. Right. And you can put the dried herbs in uh -huh. there. Label them really carefully. And I am still reaping the bounty of all my herbs from uh, last fall. Wow. I set aside they a day. They have lasted a long time. They, have la they uh -huh. last really well. You want to make sure that they're really, really dry. Yeah. Because if they aren't, then you have mold and moisture. Mm -hmm. So the final kind of um, saving that I want to share with you is something I stumbled onto because a, a very um, good colleague of mine told me about it. She said, Carol, you know you can freeze parsley, don't you? And I said, no, I didn't know Before this. Before drying it is what you You don't mean. even have to dry That's, it. Yeah, you so this have is to the dry fresh. It. So this is fresh. And again, when your parsley starts looking a little sorry, it, it's still okay. So you want to chop it in whatever shapes, and I'm just doing a rough chop. Mm -hmm. And then we put it in a bag, mm -hmm. label it carefully. Mm -hmm. And oddly enough, there's enough chlorophyll in here that those little chopped parsley bits 
will retain their color. They'll freeze and they'll become a little mushy and therefore you only want to use them or only be able to use them in say casseroles cooking. or soups, uh -huh. in cooking. You won't be able to have the lovely beautiful um, flat leaf garnish that uh -huh. we, we think is so beautiful. But they're, they're still they're very usable and you're saving all that money. Uh -huh. And so I always have these little bags in my refrigerator mm -hmm. freezer that I can just reach in quickly and pop out. And, and, and another good thing I think is using these smaller ones because you, again, you don't want to yes. thaw yes. more than you're going to use too because exactly. then you might throw those away. These and these are, are just little hitters. snack bags. Uh -huh. so, um, so that's herbs in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And so there's no reason to spend a fortune and then have it go to waste, go to waste. On, on using fresh herbs when you can really, really preserve them. Well, I appreciate you sharing these tips with us. I know we've all learned something. Thank, Thank you. you. Matthew, thank you so much for being with us. I <clears throat> enjoyed reading the website about Guardians of Rescue, and, and uh, I know that I feel very compassionate about uh, trying to find animals. I, I've had dogs, and I have cats, and I grew up on a farm, so we always had lots of animals around. But tell us briefly about what the Guardians of Rescue do, and where all are you located? We're, uh, we're based out of Long Island, New York. Uh, the Guardians of Rescue are about compassionate action uh, when it comes to animal rights and welfare. Well, we, go, uh, we go way out of our way to help people uh, keep families together when they can't afford vet bills. Uh, we'll raise money for them. We'll, uh, we, we try and educate children into the compassionate way of, of, mm -hmm. of treating and dealing with animals. Uh, basically, basically trying to keep uh, shelters from being overloaded. We do a lot of work with the military, bringing their dogs back from Afghanistan and, uh, and PTSD therapy dogs. Very important, very important. That, that's what I'd like to talk to you about. I, I've I've heard about you know people getting permission in hospitals to take the per, the patient's pet in and what how much good it does and uh, but I hadn't thought about the the military aspect of it. How did you get involved in that part of it? We actually got a phone call uh, from a woman whose brother was a Green Beret in Afghanistan and while on patrol they found two puppies and they they snuck them back on base and they just. From what the, it's a consensus among the soldiers we've helped that the, the dogs are their apple pie. They remind them that somewhere in the world, life still has a value and love still has a place in the order of things. Uh, when they get either redeployed or when the dogs get found out because they're, they're not allowed to have non-military pets on base, uh, the options are very limited. You're in a war zone. It's basically euthanize the dog is, is usually uh, the outcome. We work with the only animal shelter in Afghanistan. It's run by a Royal Marine Commando named Penn Farthing. He expatriated to Afghanistan after his tour of duty was up from the, uh, the Royal Marine Commandos to start this shelter. because he, he saw, saw the need for yeah, it. Yeah, how important the dogs were to his boys. Uh -huh. So now he takes all the allied dogs. If you can get the dog to Nauzad, he will keep that dog alive and do his best to get it back to the States. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we put out, like, like uh, Guardians of Rescue is all volunteer, and we rely completely on uh, donations mm -hmm. to do what we're doing. So we put it out to our friends and fans. This is what we want to do. We want to get these dogs back for these guys. And people, uh, NASCAR teams, have come out to help us bring these dogs back. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually got Trigger was a dog. He was uh, an Afghan coochie hound, about 70 pounds at seven months old. Big wow. boy, yeah. We flew him from... Uh, uh, Qatar to Kennedy Airport. Uh, we held him for uh, a couple of months while his human cycled back to the world, which wound oh. up being Fort Lewis. So they have an adjustment period too, just like people. Well, uh, a lot of times um, special forces, they take a little bit longer to cycle out from their tour of duty to go back to the world. They have to go from you know, oh. uh, Afghanistan to Germany to Texas, then back to Seattle. So by the, well, while they were doing that, we held the boy mm -hmm. and we Not hung out with him. Mm -hmm. And then we reunited him. And when uh, when that dog saw his human, uh, I mean, the, those two guys, and you talk about a green <laughs> Great beret. Great reunion. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a magnificent moment. <laughs> well, what about those, uh, and, and we always think of military primarily, that come back with the PTSD, the post-traumatic stress syndrome, but it's not just military people. It could be any of us who've had maybe a tragedy in our life or uh, some life-changing sure. event. Well, uh, uh, being a New Yorker, uh, I mean, uh, the events of 9-11, yeah, that uh, that brought it that, to our attention. Yeah, didn't it? that that really right. shocked a lot of people. And you know, when you're in the military, not not that it lessens the blow of seeing something horrible, but you're taught you're gonna see something horrible, mm -hmm. and you're you're gonna go to war. 
um, you know, an iron worker in, in New York, he's, you know, he goes to work one day and the next thing you know, he's <laughs> in war. So. Right. But how, how do you train a dog differently to be uh, positioned with someone that is suffering maybe from P PTSD rather than just maybe if I adopted one? Well, you can, you, you tap them and test the animal. You, you know, you look at them. Some dogs are a little more aggressive. Some dogs are a little more compassionate, a little more oh. mushy. And you just, you nurture that part of the animal. Uh, what's, what's unique about these dogs from Afghanistan is when the soldiers save them, they're little puppies, mm -hmm. and they grow up with soldiers. So at night when they come home from combat and they're going through that immediate soldier stress of the combat that they endured that day, that puppy grows up custom attuned to assuaging that specific soldier stress. So uh, a lot of times these guys will have many years left on their hitch. They're, they're going around the world. So to keep the dog in, in foster for years is just, it's unfair to the dog. We'll find other soldiers who are done oh. with their deployment, done with their tour, adopt the dog to them anywhere in the nation. We actually had two dogs. One went to Hawaii, one went to Texas last week. Uh -huh. um, and then we can show the soldiers that saved the dog a picture of their battle buddy at home on green grass with the soldier's wife and his kids living the life they always wanted for that dog. And just for them to know that their buddy that uh -huh. got him through all those rough nights in combat is with a brother soldier and safe and is going to finish his life with the American dream. It's, it's wow. really, it's what the Guardians are all about. Well, yeah, you bet. And I understand that if, if left untreated, people who suffer from PTSD can suffer lots of things, maybe from alcoholism to severe depression. Severe but depression. somehow these animals can prevent that from happening. Uh, a Green Brave from uh, Vietnam, uh, a gentleman named Tony, severe PTSD. The poor guy is really suffering. He adopted a dog that we sprung from the shelter. I saw this beautiful American Bull Terrier, and she just wasn't doing well in the shelter. We took her out, we assessed her. She was a wonderful dog. She relieves him from that stress. When he starts going through that, that picture in his mind over and over again, she'll touch her nose against his hand and snap him out of it. Really? Yeah, uh -huh. and, and his, his trips to the VA hospital have decreased considerably. Just, just to have that pure love, mm -hmm. that pure compassion, that non-judgmental animal right there. And, and mm -hmm. they know, they're custom attuned. They, they see you starting to go into that mental loop and she will break him out of it. She will come over wow. and, and push up against him. I, wonder, I was going to ask you, how do they do it? How are they trained to do that? Well, they just sense it. Yeah, yeah, they sense it. They, mm -hmm. they love their person, they love their human. And when they see their human starting to, to go through that mm -hmm. stress, their face starts to twitch, she comes right over and starts pushing on them mm -hmm. and, and rubbing and you know and, and <laughs> yeah you're important yeah um, you mentioned the veterans hospitals are are these dogs then allowed to go when the the person has a checkup or has a an appointment we have programs where we try and take the dogs and work them through to get actually therapy certified uh, we're working with a couple of veterans we've adopted out over two dozen dogs that we've gotten from Afghanistan to soldiers uh -huh. and most of these guys um, you know they're combat veterans they, they've been through a lot of really really difficult situations they see the help the dog gives them and they want to share that with their brethren. So we have programs where we actually go through the motions to get the dogs certified so that legally they can be brought they into can. hospitals and they can continue the therapy. So when they go to group sessions, they can, they can spread that joy with the rest of their brethren. See. So there is a process that ha a person has to go through before they can't just take any dog they want to into a, into hospital, a hospital for an yeah. appointment. That's amazing. Well, it's, it's wonderful the things that you're doing. People can go to your website, guardiansofrescue.org, O-R-G, and uh, maybe set up a group in their own local community, or if they feel so compelled, I'm sure you could tell them how to help you. Absolutely, and uh, if, uh, if anybody out there knows any soldiers, any service personnel that uh, need help yeah. like this, the biggest thing is they don't know we're here to help them. No. And uh, to, to teach them about the, the Nowzad shelter in Afghanistan, um, that, that we are bringing these dogs back, uh, that any of their friends that have a dog over there, so if, if they go to guardiansofrescue.org uh, and check us out, we, we can tell them exactly how to go about getting That's their dog a back from point. Afghanistan. Yeah, because I had never heard of the organization, and, and you're on Facebook too, so yes. people can, can find you, and that's the important thing, to educate everyone. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Matthew. Thank I've you enjoyed talking me. to you. Always a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed the show today. Next time on Creative Living, we'll learn how to make 16 handcrafted cards in under an hour. We'll talk to the editors of Bella Crafts Quarterly, and we'll demonstrate some easy one-step furniture makeovers. One of my next guests is going to show how to make 16 cards in about an hour. These mini cards are perfect for adding to a gift or as a note for a friend. And by making them in advance, you'll ensure you always have a supply ready to go when they're needed.
We'll meet and talk to two designers, crafters, and magazine editors who created the first completely free online magazine dealing with all areas of crafts and related projects. They'll discuss how the magazine came to be, who contributes to it, and how to use it. The magazine is Bella Crafts Quarterly. And finally, we'll meet a guest who will show how to make some quick and easy furniture makeovers for people who don't have a lot of time and who want to start and finish a project in one day. All of these topics will be featured on the next Creative Living Show. If you ever have comments or suggestions or ideas for shows, you can email me at cheryl.borden at ennmu.edu. I'd also like to ask you to become a fan of Creative Living on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com and in the search window type in Creative Living with Cheryl Borden. I hope you'll plan to join me next time for Creative Living. We are very pleased to offer a new booklet that accompanies this series of Creative Living. This booklet is titled the 6700 series and it features a wonderful collection of ideas and information and it's available free of charge on our website. Posted as a PDF file, you can simply download the entire booklet or just the segments you're most interested in. You'll find information on foods, nutrition, clothing, fashion, health and beauty, home decorating, and much more. For your copy of this new booklet, go to our website at kenw.org and then click on Creative Living. Scroll down to the booklet section and you can click on this booklet or on any of the other booklets we have available online. Just go to KENW.org, click on Creative Living, and download the booklet titled The 6700 Series. We also invite you to sign up for our free e-newsletter. Just go to KENW.org and click on the Sign Up Now button and input your email address. That's all there is to it. You'll enjoy reading an up-to-date newsletter filled with interesting topics and information. Thank you.